Ka kui kui, ka kua kua katere ka whanau. Wai hoke au ka kaua nei te puni nei te wānanga i te tau mira mai e. Tui e te kawe, teiranga te kawe. Ko te kawe o i o, ko te kawe o te haere. E ngā iwi, e ngā reo, e ngā mana, e ngā waka. Nā mai haere mai e kawe i tā kutua. Tēnā kutua, tēnā kutua. When I went over to New Zealand on my first mission, I had only been there a day or two when a nice sister came running to me and said, help Come me. over, please. What is it? What do you need? I need your help. Come. I went over to the home, and there was a little boy, 10 or 11, I guess. He had fallen from a tree. She said, Fix him up. I said, You ought to have a doctor. I had never ministered to anybody in my life. Never. She said, the doctor isn't home. He's away from town. We don't need a doctor. You fix him. Well, I got down. He lay on the floor. I anointed him, and I sealed the anointing. You know, I guess God wanted to humble me. The next day he was climbing trees again. Every bone had knit. I was just a young boy. I use the priesthood which I hold. God is with us, and he uses us for the accomplishment of his purposes. Better not fall out of this tree again, though. Matthew Cowley was not the greatest organizer. He wasn't a great leader in the sense like some of the brethren are, but he had more faith than any man I've ever known. And I've traveled for 35 years with all of the general authorities and, and, and met them all and know them all, but I think Brother Cowley had more faith than anyone. In July of 1895, Matthias F. Cowley and his wife, Abby Hyde Cowley, welcomed an apostle of the Lord into their home in Preston, Idaho. Elder Moses Thatcher, an apostle of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, had come to offer a dedicatory prayer over their newly built home. Abby Cowley described in her journal the events of that day. At about 1 p.m., we knelt in prayer the prayer offered was very beautiful. 
He asked the Lord to protect it from all harm, that no evil influence might enter therein, that herein might be born prophets, seers, and revelators to honor God, that great faith, the greatest of all gifts, should be exercised. Two years after this prophetic prayer, Matthew Cowley was born in that home on August 2, 1897. Though neither parent would live to see their son sustained as a prophet, seer, and revelator, it was only two months after Matthew's birth that his father was called to serve on the Council of the Twelve Apostles. Just after Matthew's first birthday, the Cowleys moved to Salt Lake City, Utah, settling in a home on West Temple Avenue. And so Matthew grew up on West Temple Street, just a block from the Salt Lake Temple, where he had many wonderful neighbors, including many members of the uh, general authorities of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But the Cowley grew up on West Temple and lived in the same ward with President George Albert Smith and his father and several other apostles. They lived on what was known generally as Apostles Row. And George Albert Smith helped raise Brother Cowley as a boy and had a great effect on the life of Matthew Cowley. As Matthew grew older, he developed a reputation in the neighborhood as a prankster. One winter's day, Matthew prepared a slick patch of ice in the middle of the sidewalk in front of his home. Then he stood near it and warned those passing by to watch their step in hopes they would reward him for his thoughtfulness. Years later, he recalled that one of his customers was the apostle John Henry Smith, who gave him a nickel for his good deed. But this mischievous and fun-loving spirit was balanced with a sober mind and a great love of the scriptures. Less inclined to sports, Matthew was most interested in reading and could often be found reading in the Bible and the Book of Mormon. At the age of 16, Matthew asked for the opportunity to serve a mission for the LDS Church. And I was called on a mission. They didn't used to screen them in those days like they do now. The bishop would just look around and see what was going on, and then he'd say, oh, oh, there's young Cowley. We better get him out in the mission field and get him there quick. Matthew's two older brothers had enthralled him with stories of their missions to Hawaii, so he was excited when his call came to serve in the same islands. But the Lord had other plans for Matthew. Later, he related what LDS Apostle Anthon Lund said. Yeah, my mission call. The he looked Island. at me with a smile and okay. said, You know, Matt, the Hawaiian, the Hawaiian mission isn't far enough away. The farther we can get you away from this neighborhood, the better it's going to be for all of us. And Hawaii isn't far enough. I think we had better get you down there in New Zealand. That's right down at the uttermost bounds of the earth, the jumping off place for the South Pole. I was having dinner tonight and the Spirit told me you should go to New Zealand instead of Hawaii. I don't know why. If it's all right with you, I will tell President Smith in the morning, and you will be sent to New Zealand. Matthew accepted the change in his calling. Little did he realize that he was destined to spend more than 13 years of his life among the Maori of New Zealand, where he would develop a deep love for this island people, and they for him. So having just turned 17 years old, young Matthew Cowley found himself at the uttermost bounds of the earth, where he would come to love the simple faith and open hearts of the Maori people. My love for this people has reached such a degree that I fear that I will be robbed of contentment after my return to Zion. If it was not for the tie which binds me to my father, mother, brothers, and sisters, I would like to devote my whole life to the interests of these Pacific Islanders. While serving in his first area of Judea, Elder Cowley learned that walking and riding great distances came with the territory. In his journal, he kept track of his journeys. This week's travel, on a bicycle, 58 miles. By train, 37 miles. On horseback, eight miles. One day, Elder Cowley was making his way home. It was a long ride, but the horse knew the way. 
Along the trail, Matthew fell asleep and had an unusual dream. I saw myself as a little boy sitting on my father's lap, and I was scared. A man with a big long beard past his belt came over and put his hands on my head. I could see myself and my father and this old man. Then I woke up, still on the horse, and the thought came to me, I wonder if I have ever had a patriarchal blessing. Upon arriving home that night, Elder Cowley wrote a letter to his mother asking if he had ever received a patriarchal blessing. Two months later, he received a reply from his mother. When you were five years old, you went with your father and stayed in the home of an old patriarch named Luther Burnham. While visiting, your father asked the patriarch to give his little boy a patriarchal blessing, and he did, but you were scared. Your father told me when he came home that he had to hold you. You crawled up onto his lap, shivering and scared, so he put his arms around you. The man put his hands on your head and bestowed upon you your patriarchal blessing. Incidentally, he had a long white beard that went down below his belt. Enclosed is your patriarchal blessing. My beloved son Matthew, I place my hands upon your head and confer upon you a patriarchal blessing. Thou shalt live to be a mighty man in Israel, for thou art a royal seed, the seed of Jacob through Joseph. Thou shalt become a great and mighty man in the eyes of the Lord, and become an ambassador of Christ to the uttermost bounds of the earth. Your understanding shall become great, and your wisdom reach to heaven. The Lord will give you mighty faith as the brother of Jared, for thou shalt know that he lives, and that the gospel of Jesus Christ is true, even in your youth. As Elder Cowley blessed and taught and worked alongside the people of New Zealand, he saw the fulfillment of his patriarchal blessing, that with mighty faith he would bless this people at the uttermost bounds of the earth. While Elder Cowley was adjusting very well to his new surroundings, he still struggled with one thing in particular, New Zealand fleas. I've forgotten to mention before that the fleas are my best companions. I call them best companions because they stick to me so close. Before going to bed, I fortified myself against the fleas. I rubbed flea powder all over my body and put a layer of it in the bed. I trust that will stupefy them. On arising and looking in the bed, I found the carcasses of a multitude of fleas, and it made me feel like Napoleon, to be the victor of such a battle. Another challenge for Elder Cowley was the Maori language. Though many of the Maori spoke at least some English, he knew how important it was that he learned to communicate with them in their native tongue. The first meeting I attended in Judea, I didn't understand a word that was being said. And after the meeting, a sister who could speak English said to me, do you know what they said in there, what they did? I said, I couldn't understand a word. She says, well, you were called and sustained as the secretary of the Relief Society of the Judea branch. <laughs> and I made up my mind right there and then that the Relief Society was not going to take any liberty with my time as a missionary without me knowing something about it. And so I determined to get the gift of the Maori language even if I had to work for it. And I did have to work for it. I studied 11 hours every day for several weeks. I read the Book of Mormon in Maori. My studies were punctuated with fasting and with prayer. He learned the language in 10 months by reading the Book of Mormon in Maori, by conversing with the older generation in Maori and looking at the words and getting the understanding that he needed. And when he was able to speak, he bore his testimony in Maori and he told them what he was there for.
or about eight months. He was sick with a sunstroke and some other problems, but many, many boils and that. During that period of time, he learned the Maori language very, very well because he was unable to travel and he didn't get a chance to leave Judea. So he would get up in the morning, sometimes study for eight, 16 and 18 hours a day working on the language and then he'd go back and the old Maori lady where he lived would listen to him and correct him. I think Brother Cowley became the greatest Maori speaker that we've ever had in the church, including the best of the Maoris. Finally, within 11 or 12 weeks, and all by myself with no missionary to encourage me, I had the audacity to stand up before a group of natives and preach the gospel in their own tongue. I was using words I had never read or heard, and there was a burning in my bosom the like of which I had never felt before, nor since in my life. My mind was not like I was a child. The power of God was speaking through me, as a youngster, 17 years of age. Elder Cowley's mastery of the language became legendary among the people and the other missionaries. Not only did he learn their language, but he spoke after the manner of traditional Maori orators. And not only did he work to master the spoken language, but the written as well. Beginning as a young missionary, Elder Cowley learned to write in Maori by keeping a faithful journal in the language for more than 30 years. That's a good part of his life, that he wrote all of his diaries in Maori. And after he died and there wasn't anybody to look around for to, to translate, uh, Elva called me, uh, Sister Cowley called me and said, so I've got all of these diaries of maps. I don't have anybody to translate them. Do you think there's any possibility you could do it? I said, it would be one of the great experiences of my life. I would love to. So she brought them up. And uh, it was just fascinating for me to read that and see how well he had preserved that language, which he really knew and loved so well. Some described Elder Cowley as speaking like an educated Maori, but it's doubtful that as a young missionary, he fully understood how his language skills would end up blessing the Maori for many years to come. Expecting to return home after serving three years, his mission president, James Lambert, asked Elder Cowley to stay and retranslate the Book of Mormon and to translate for the first time the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price. The Book of Mormon was translated many years ago into the Maori language by our cousin, Ezra Foss Richards. In 1917, at the request of President Joseph F. Smith, I assisted the mission president in preparing a new edition. This was a work of revising and proofreading. I changed the translation of some 2,500 verses. This was done only when, after reading the verse from the original translation to several natives, they were unable to explain the contents of the verse. I would change the translation until they could give a clear explanation of the verse. After the Book of Mormon was completed, two native brethren and I were set apart by the president to translate the Doctrine and Covenants and Pearl of Great Price. The three of us would read a verse in English, then each of us would make our own translation into Maori. We would then read the three translations and select the best. We continued this method for two or three weeks, and then, because my translation was the one invariably that was chosen, my two friends left me to it, and I spent two years translating these two books. I can say in all sincerity that I experienced during this work the feeling of a helping power outside and beyond my own. Now when I read these books, I marvel that I was the one that was supposed to have done the translating. The language surpasses my own individual knowledge of it. The second edition of the Book of Mormon was translated in the Duncan um, and that's where myself and many others were brought up. My grandfather and my wife's grandfather were the two who were with Matthew Cowley when they translated the Book of Mormon into the Maori language. And over a 15-month period, while he was doing the Pearl of Great Price, he went to church 
uh, to a fast meeting one day, and two little Maori babies were brought in. And uh, the parents, they were cousins. And the parents said to him, Elder Callie, would you name our baby? So there was a little boy and a little girl. So the Maoris have a custom of when they ask you to name the baby, you get to choose the name. So he gets up and he names the little girl Pearl, and he names the boy Great Price, after the Pearl of Great Price. Well, I'm the grandchild of Apikata Pawai and Niriaha Pawai, and they had twins in 1918, 10th of July. The eldest one was Pearl, and she was named by Matthew Cowley, and the second one was Alice. Now, Alice and Pearl were raised separately. Alice was raised in the church, and Pearl was raised out of the church. And as I was a child growing up, I always knew the story of Pearl and Great Price Harris. A lot of people used to say that, uh, what a queer name, Great Price, until later when they found out that uh, Matthew Cowley named them. Dear Mother, you can't imagine what a grand experience it is to go into the vineyard and put your whole heart and soul into your work and receive inspiration from the greatest mind in existence. You cannot compare it with any other work. It is so far above them all, it would be foolish to try to find a work that would be as beneficial to the human race. Although I am laboring without a companion, I do not complain, because it is far greater to rely on the greatest of all beings for help than to rely on a senior companion who has been in the service only a few months longer than yourself. In May of 1919, Matthew Cowley was officially released from his mission. President Lambert wrote a letter to Matt's parents. Your son Matthew is now released and is returning home within the next few days. I was down at Hawks Bay last week when a farewell entertainment was given him and could you have seen the many expressions of love and appreciation that were bestowed upon him, I know you would have rejoiced and thanked the Lord. Never before have I seen such love to an elder as was shown on this occasion. The whole native village turned out to bid him goodbye, and as we left, tears were shed. Years later, Matthew Cowley would reflect on the impact that his first mission to New Zealand would have on the rest of his life. To you in the isles of the sea, I say unto you, were it not for you, I wouldn't be standing here this day. To you in New Zealand, and when I speak to you, I speak to all those who dwell on those beautiful isles. Were it not for you, implanting within the heart of me as a 17-year-old kid, your simple faith, your knowledge of God, your demonstration that the veil between God and man can be very, very thin. I wouldn't be standing here today at the hub of Zion speaking to you way down under in this capacity. This is not my calling alone, you good Maori people. This is yours. Ehari out the Karangatangane, na koto tonu, no reda, na tato taturanga, e tune ao. In 1919, the University of Utah had fewer than 2,000 students. One of these was 22-year-old Matthew Cowley. Because he had left to serve a mission at such a young age, Matthew had never even finished high school. In order to receive the special permission needed to be admitted to the university, Matthew met individually with all 39 non-LDS faculty to convince them that his time spent in New Zealand was at least the equivalent of a high school diploma. Let me think about this and I'll get back to you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. When he finished speaking with all of them, not only did they admit him to the university, but granted him two years of credit. He would start college as a junior. Matthew thrived at the university level and earned his undergraduate degree in only two years. 
And then uh, he had a desire to go to law school. And uh, he was accepted to go to the George Washington Law School in Washington, D.C. In the meantime, Matthew had met a charming young lady by the name of Elva Taylor. And uh, he was very much uh, taken with Elva. And uh, he had to leave her to go to law school in Washington. The two continued their courtship through correspondence. Always the prolific writer, Matthew sent a letter off to Elva every other day during the entire time they were apart. It wasn't long before they both felt they were ready for a deeper commitment. There came a time in my life when I decided I should get married. I was then attending school in Washington. I made plans with my sweetheart, and she's the one I married. I rushed her so fast she couldn't send me a Dear John letter. But I was struggling to earn my way in Washington, to get an education, and I didn't have enough money to come home and get married in the temple. And so we made plans to get married in New York. And then when I finished school, we were to come home and be sealed in the temple. We even had the announcements printed. Then all of a sudden, my father heard about it. He wasn't a man of means, never successful in a business way. And I guess things looked pretty dark for him, as far as I was concerned. And so he went out and put his hand into the hand of God. And I know he did it on his knees. And in response to that prayer, I received money from him. And he said, you have to come home and get married right in the first day. And so I came home, and we went to the temple. And I'll never forget that morning, on the 13th of July. They were married in the Salt Lake Temple by Matthew's old Sunday school teacher, George Albert Smith. After he completed law school, he came back to Utah and he started his practice as a young attorney. And uh, as an attorney, he wasn't interested in making money, but in helping people. In the early 1930s, he was elected to be the county attorney in Salt Lake City. And there as county attorney, he was always trying to help the people that had gotten in trouble uh, and he was always their friend. During these years as an attorney, Matthew Cowley worked hard to be a good husband and father. For in 1926, he and Alva had been blessed with a beautiful baby girl whom they named Jewel. But once again, the Lord had a greater design in mind. After he'd practiced law for about uh, 13 years, uh, the first presidency called him in again and said, Matthew, would you like to go back to New Zealand on a mission? And he said, well, I'll leave it up to you at your call. If you want me to go, we will go. And so in early 1938, they told him they would like him to go back to New Zealand and become the mission president of the New Zealand mission. The Cowleys arrived in April of 1938. They were greeted by many of the saints. President Cowley was able to renew old friendships and make new ones and Sister Cowley was finally able to rub noses with friends she'd been hearing about for almost 20 years. When he left the first time, my mother was only a young girl at the time. She was, she was very beautiful. And uh, Matthew Cowley said to her, says, Well, Mary, when you get married and you have a, a son, and he, if he's good looking, I want you to name him after me. Well, I met, and that's how, uh, that's how I got my name from President Matthew Cowley. President Cowley now found himself the head of a mission numbering about 9,000 members and 62 missionaries. His leadership style was not what one might expect from a mission president. To the casual observer, it may have seemed haphazard, but those who worked at his side saw it differently. 
It was a great pleasure to be a missionary under the direction of Matthew County. He loved all of us, even those of us with our terrible weaknesses. And some of us weren't great missionaries, but it didn't make much difference to him. He, was, he always seemed happy to have us. He never liked to travel alone. If he left headquarters, he always wanted someone with him, so he'd pick up missionaries and take them. Toward the end of my mission, I had had some sickness and some real trouble, and so he had me come into the headquarters, and then he made me the assistant secretary to the mission. And I asked him what I should do as assistant secretary. He said, well, just help Elder Haslam, but let him do all the hard work, and you just help him, but be ready to travel because I want you to go with me a lot of different places. He said, you take your little briefcase and keep a clean shirt or two and a tie and some clean socks and underwear in your briefcase and just keep it by your desk and I'll come in your office and yell, let's go. And when I say let's go, you beat me to the car and don't ask any questions. When President Cowley would open the door and say, let's go, I'd grab that briefcase and I always managed to beat him to the car. But he said, don't ask any questions. And, you know, I wondered why that was. But we'd get in the car, and after a while, he'd say, you got any idea where we're going? And I'd say, no, I, I won't. I'm not going to ask any questions. He said, if I knew where we were going, I'd tell you. But we're just going somewhere. He said, somewhere in New Zealand, they need us, and we're going to we'll go down the road for a few miles before we turn off to where he felt he ought to go. We'd get to a place, and sure enough, there was always someone waiting for him. It's just a, a, an unbelievable thing. He pulled into Hastings, New Zealand one day and there were two women by the post office where he always went. But when he arrived there, these two women, one of them said, see, I told you, if we just wait here long enough, he'd be here. And they had been praying for the president to come. It was a, a, an interesting thing how he lived by the, the spirit and went places where he was needed. One of those little trips we went on. President Kelly had the opportunity of speaking as he oft times did at a marae. And he was a magnificent Maori orator. Uh, you would think from hearing his tapes even now or hearing him when he was still alive, there was hardly anyone who was a better English orator than he. Matter of fact, when President George Albert Smith, who called him to be an apostle, and he told him at the time, that I don't want you ever to prepare a talk in writing. I just want you to talk. And uh, that is what he did all the time, and especially while he was talking in Maori. And President Cowley knew how to use the tokotoko, which was like a Maori cane, and pace back and forth and punctuate the parts he wanted to emphasize with his tokotoko. Just absolutely as good an orator as you will hear. He had a great vocabulary, best vocabulary of anyone I had ever known. He was a speed reader. He read a book every single day that he was in New Zealand. He could read a 300-page book in about two and a half hours. And I used to challenge him once in a while when he turned page. I, I, I was brave enough to say, you're just fooling. You're, but he could tell you what he'd read. He had the greatest memory that I'd ever known. For President, or Tumaki Kauli as he was called, being out visiting and ministering to the saints was of utmost importance. President Kauli would stay in the homes of the members. And uh, when he would stay in the homes of the members, the word would get around all over that uh, President Kauli is here and staying with so-and-so. And he would have people start to line up almost as soon as he got there. And they would line up in front of the house and they wanted to receive a blessing from him. And he would stay up and give blessings until way after midnight. And uh, those blessings are some that the members, at least when I was there, they had uh, almost uh, emblazoned in their memory so well they could almost repeat the blessings years later that they had. When we had huitos or huiparias, back home in, our, in the Kongata area, people would come to our house after, like on the Monday, and sit and wait for him to give them a blessing. But uh, they would just come and wait all day long, and while they were waiting, my mother would always have food on the table for the people to, so they wouldn't get hungry. And we even had a couple of ministers from the Church of England 
that came and went through and uh, I imagine they received a blessing from him too because you know the door closed after they went in there but uh, he never turned anybody away I went to a place there one day it was during the war years the young man brought his child to me he says President Cowley I want you to christen our baby I said it looks a bit of an old child to be blessed why haven't you brought it before oh he said I just haven't got around to it so I said, all right, what's the name? And I was just about to bless the child, and he said, while you are giving it its name, please give it its vision. It was born blind. Just like that. Just as a matter of fact. You have the authority to give this child a name and a blessing, and you have the authority to give it its vision. I was overwhelmed. I was doubtful in my mind. But I knew that within... The being of that Polynesian, there was the simple faith of a child, a simple faith in God and the promises he had made through his son, Jesus Christ. I gave that child its name, and eventually I mustered up enough courage to bless it with its vision. I saw it a few months ago. It's now six or seven years old, running all over the place and can see as well as I can see this day. Hands shall be laid upon the sick, and they shall be made well. That little boy's name was Junior Wanira. Junior was born in Porirua, New Zealand, and his family and friends are all familiar with the story of a priesthood blessing from President Matthew Cowley. We're not quite sure when my brother's sight came in. But there was no reason for him to have his sight because the specialists had already told him there was no way they could bring his sight in. And so this was one of the miracles of Tuluki Kali that he received his sight. I do have a strong, very strong testimony of the church and that all that was that was given to me by by President Kali, the sight to uh, to enjoy life more and, and to see everything around me and to um, be able to, to do the things that I'm doing today. I'm very thankful that, that he was able to give me that blessing. That's, oh yes, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with it and so is my family. President Cowley spoke often of the simple faith of the Maori saints, faith sufficient to heal them, but also of their faithful obedience to the principles of the gospel. On one occasion, I called in to see this grand little woman in her 80s, blind. She doesn't live in an organized branch, has no contact with the priesthood except as the missionaries visit there. She was out in her backyard by her little fire. I reached forth my hand to shake hands with her and I was going to rub noses with her and she says, don't shake hands with me. And I says, oh, that's clean dirt on your hands. I'm willing to shake hands with you. She said, not yet. And then she got on her hands and knees and crawled over toward her little house. And there was a spade. She lifted up that spade and crawled off in another direction. She finally arrived at a spot and started digging down into the soil with that spade. It finally struck something hard she took out the soil with her hands and lifted out a fruit jar. She opened that fruit jar and took something out and handed it to me. And it turned out to be New Zealand money. In American money, it would have been equivalent to $100. She says, there is my tithing. Now I can shake hands with the priesthood of God. I said, you don't owe that much tithing. She says, I know it. I don't owe it now. But I'm paying some in advance for I do not know when the priesthood of God will get around this way again. And then I leaned over and pressed my nose and forehead against hers, and the tears from my eyes ran down her cheeks. And as I left her, I asked God to bring down upon me a curse. If from that day, henceforth and forever, I didn't return to God one-tenth of all that should ever come into my hand. He was a man of faith. Our people loved him because he, did, he didn't um, 
hold back the truth. If there was anything that we needed to improve our lives with, he would tell us. Then he would love us. He was always able to inspire us. It was like his very presence, he seemed to um, invigorate and stimulate us. He was a striking young man. He had a spiritual look about him and he was the most profound teacher I have ever listened to. He taught the people faith, hope and charity. These are the three great principles. And also he introduced another, uh, uh, another word and he called it kiangawari. Kiangawari translated into, into English means be soft and gentle, be understanding, be loving and be kind and be true to yourselves. He was a man that knew Maori so well, and the Maoris just loved him. And in Hui Tao's district meetings and in mission meetings, he could reprimand them for what they were doing wrong, and they loved him for it. And he could correct their moral habits and their visual habits without being offensive to them. Matthew Cowley used to come to conferences. In those days, they were Hui Party Hus or what we call now a state conference. We had one in Whakaki. This Sunday morning, Matthew Cowley was waiting in the hall they were supposed to meet in with the district president at the time. They waited five minutes, 10 minutes, and he came out. Rugby was a religion in Nuhaka, and on, sitting on the veranda were all these gentlemen, all priesthood holders and all keen footballers they were playing the rugby game on a Sunday. And, uh, and so he sat there and looked at them, he said to them, in Maori, e hoa ma, ho mutu pe te whutsupori nani, ma mai hatata mai nga te atua. You know, it shocked those men because they'd forgotten the time. But you know, he said it so nicely, he didn't chastise them in the wrong way, he chastised them in the Maori way, ngawari. As a mission president, Matthew Cowley left a lasting impression on the elders over whom he presided. I think the greatness of Matthew Cowley and why the missionaries that worked under him and loved him so much was because of his great sense of humor that was uh, not this serious all the time about religion and things like that, but a great sense of humor that everyone enjoyed about him. And he had uh, a lot of feeling for his fellow man. There came into my office one day two young Maoris, brothers, they were in uniform, they had volunteered, they do not draft or conscript the natives of New Zealand into military service, they have to volunteer. These young men had volunteered, they were in uniform, they were about to embark for the Near East. They came into my office, I detected the odor of liquor. But I was not surprised when they asked me for a blessing. And I said to them, I knew them well, I had lived at the home of their mother on my first mission. I said, do you deserve a blessing? They knew what I meant. They said, I think we do now. We repented a few minutes ago. Matthew Cowley was a very powerful speaker and he was a very human type of person. Matthew was a, a great man. Everybody loved him, and he loved everybody, and everybody was comfortable around him. He was able to say and do the right things that made people feel good. The more I came to know him, the more uh, I found of his sense of humor and his compassion and his love for particularly the Maori people. And I believe I can truly say that he grew to love the missionaries. He liked missionaries who were full of fun. In fact, one time in the mission home, he got after all of us one night at the supper table. He said, you're all working too hard. There's not much fooling around in the home anymore. He said, I like some activity. If you want to be transferred, keep going like you're going. If you want to stay, I want a little action. So we put on a few of our crazy antics and did a few things which made him happy. He was that way. 
I remember a time when we were frolicking around in the mission home, as elders will do at times, and uh, we had these white porcelain doorknobs and uh, we had already paid a trick on a couple of the others and they were getting back at uh, Bob Crandall and I, who was my companion, so just before we went up to retire, they painted the white porcelain doorknobs with white paint so that when we got up there, the paint would be wet when we opened the doors. The only problem was that Tumaki Kali went up there ahead of us, and he's the one that turned the doorknob to see what, uh, what we were doing in there, and he got the wet paint on his hand and on his suit. But along with the fun, President Cowley expected his missionaries to work hard and to create the kind of connection with the Maori people that he had on his mission. His first counsel to incoming missionaries was to learn the language and to immerse themselves in the culture. He saw this as the principal means of winning the love and respect of the Maori. President Cowley was so loved and esteemed by New Zealand, no matter where he went, people would hear that he's coming and they'd say in Maui, I get the heart of my President Cowley. Well, it would go right throughout the area that President Cowley was back. He understood the Maoris, he, he knew the language well, and he could even wave the Maori. But um, he was good at everything in Maori. He was like, more like a brother to us, President Cody. He could come and put his arm around you and say, Kia ora, and you'd look up at him and say, Kia ora, President. We, that shyness had, you know, had loosened from us, and he became more or less one of the whānau, meaning one of the family. Well, I considered him a, not just the mission president, but a, um, a very wise man and also a father figure. President Cowley was just that person that you could look up to, respect and appreciate what he had to say. President Cowley reciprocated this deep bond of love However, the true depths of his love for the Maori would become evident when he met a baby boy who was being raised by his aging aunt. I remember him calling his wife Sue, that was her nickname. He kept saying, Sue, we ought to get that boy. Finally, they decided to give it a try. So he said, Elder I take the car and take Elder Crandall. We want to see the baby. So we drove over and uh, the mother and brother Crandall and I got in the car and took the baby back to the mission home. And they played with him and got in love with him and then we took him back. That went on for two or three sessions. And all the time that was going on, President Cowley was making all the necessary legal arrangements. Tony was born on the 7th of July, 1939. And by that time, it was June the 1st, 1940. So he was 11 months old. And after a few sessions, we went over and got him for real. Duncan Tony Cowley was officially adopted in June of 1940. He was immediately surrounded by the many arms that wanted to hold and care for him, and not just the Cowleys. I think that the missionaries spoiled Tony. We had him there at the mission home, and everybody loved him and took care of him. I'm Tony Cowley and I was named by my father as Nopera Duncan Meha Cowley, who were the first uh, high priests of the LDS Church in New Zealand. As a child, when my father would take me through town, it was always an adventure. Whether it was a haircut, although maybe small, it was the fact that I was with my father. But I've been truly blessed uh, because my father and my father's former elders from the mission have put me in the direction I should have gone. In the late 1930s, conflicts leading up to World War II became more heated in the South Pacific. The New Zealand military had been engaged for the past 15 months, and in October of 1940, it appeared that the war would be brought to the islands. As a result, the First Presidency ordered all missionaries out of New Zealand. When we were called home on account of the war, 
There were only 43 missionaries left in the whole of New Zealand. And my job was to get us on the boat and get us out of the country. So we had to gather up all 43 missionaries and get us to the home so Brother Cowley could have us there for a little meeting of that before we left him. When we left him, he was heartbroken. He wouldn't even come to the ship to see us leave. He vacuumed the floor. He vacuumed that floor for three hours. He served during the war. All the American elders were, had to go back to America. And he was here for five years on his own with his family in Auckland. There were no stakes in those days, just one mission, the New Zealand mission. And he was in charge of this mission. President Cowley presided over the church and saw to the needs of the members. Missionary work amongst the members blossomed, and President Cowley even joked with one of his former elders in a letter that the work was finally moving forward now that the missionaries were out of the way. Near the end of his mission, President Cowley was asked by Parliament to come and address them concerning the needs of the Maori. What he really did was teach them welfare principles. Work is the important thing in the lives of people. He gave this great talk, took him in more than an hour before the parliament, and the government then said to him, now write it all out for us. And they gave him a, a secretary and asked him to write out for the New Zealand government a policy that they would adopt as the policy of handling the native people of New Zealand. The call to return home came in the fall of 1944. However, because the incoming mission president was unable to obtain passage to New Zealand, the Cowleys did not board a ship for home until the fall of 1945. After many heartfelt farewells, the Cowleys sailed for home, not knowing if they would ever return to the land of New Zealand again. When the Cowleys last saw the United States in 1938, it was a country still in the grips of the Great Depression. Their return found a country booming in post-war growth. For the first time in years, Matthew Cowley had to decide how he was going to provide for his family. In his search for work, he called on one of his former missionaries. He'd only been home three weeks. He didn't have a job, and during that three weeks, he and I went job hunting. We were gonna try and get him some job. He didn't wanna go back and practice law. He didn't know what he'd do. He didn't own a home, he didn't own a car, he didn't have a dime. He'd been in New Zealand for over eight years. He didn't have anything. Brother Cowley came home and he said to me, I want to go to conference. And so when I picked him up, he said, uh, President Smith called me last night and said, Matt, I want you to be on the front row in the tabernacle because we may call on you to pray. So you tell those ushers that I want you on the front row. So we got him in the tabernacle and I went back and sat behind and he got on the front row. And so during the course of the meeting, President J. Reuben Clark Jr. was reading off the names of the First Presidency and all of the 12, the vacancy. And when he came to the spot where 12, he paused and sustained Matthew Cowley as the new apostle. Nobody knew. Brother Cowley didn't know, his wife didn't know. President Smith had taken the 11 into a room just two minutes before meeting started and told them who the new apostle would be. And they all sustained him. So Brother Cowley then left the front row and went up and took that seat at the bottom. Though the call to the apostleship in the LDS church was a surprise to everyone, Elder Cowley immersed himself in the work, visiting missions, attending conferences, and laboring to strengthen the stakes of Zion. In December of 1946, the First Presidency created a new position in the church, a president of the Pacific Missions of the Church. They assigned their newest colleague to the post. In February of 1947, Elder Cowley began a series of visits to his new assignment, the Isles of the Sea. Over the next two years, he would administer to the saints, dedicate new chapels, and open new missions in many nations across the Pacific. Especially meaningful to Elder Kelly was his reunion with the saints in New Zealand. The bonds he forged years earlier as a missionary, then as a mission president, 
were strengthened when he returned as an apostle of the Lord, their apostle, the Polynesian apostle. Well, these natives, you know, live close to God. They have some, some kind of power. I guess it's because they just accept miracles as a matter of course. They never doubt anything. They used to scare me. Some of them come up and say, Brother Kali, I've had a dream about you. I'd say, don't tell me. Don't tell me. I don't want to hear about it. Oh, it was a good one. All right, tell me. Tell me. And they'd tell me something. At Huito, we had a drought. And there was no water. This was at Bridge Park. And, um, and the wind was blowing, the dust was flying. And he called us all into the tent. And he said, I want you all to have faith with me and we'll pray and we'll stop this wind and we'll have a bit of rain. That was a miracle I saw performed. Within 15 minutes, there were dark clouds and the rain came and the wind stopped. No later, Kate and Mahara, a hau kiaia, Kate Tania no hoki a hau, Mona, mo te mohio tanga o ngā ngākuru ki a matiu kauri. I tēnō aroha nui tia, tēnei kaumātua, e taku tūpuna, me ana tamariki. Nō reira, ka aroha te ngākau, Mona, in November of 1949, Elder Cowley was released as president of the Pacific Mission and began to focus his efforts on the stakes and missions of the church in the United States. And because of his great love for people, Elder Cowley spent the majority of his time administering to the needs of others. President Smith, his secretary, had called my office and she'd say, President Smith needs Brother Cowley. Have you any idea where he is? I said, yeah, he's sitting here waiting for us to go bless somebody. So President Smith had my phone numbers so that he could keep track of Brother Cowley. And it was okay with him if he, if he played hooky and went out and did what he came. He came to earth to bless people. He was not a church administrator in the sense that he said, I sit in on these big meetings where we spend a million dollars. He said, I don't even know what a thousand dollars is, let alone a million. So. He said, there's no use to be sitting in there. He said, when I do sit in there, he says, all I can do is watch to see what Brother Lee or Brother Kimball does. If they raise their hand, I raise my hand. If they don't, I don't. Every day was a day of blessing. We blessed hundreds and hundreds of people over the eight years that he was in the 12. In February of 1953, Elder Cowley and Glenn Rudd gave a healing blessing to a young boy who was dying from polio. Later, when they returned to visit the recovering lad, he asked them to bless his partner, who was also deathly ill with polio. And then he said, hey, how about my partner in the next bed? And there was a young fellow about 16 or 17. He says, don't go out without blessing him, because he's my partner. And I said, sure. And so I said to the boy, I said, you like a blessing? He says, yes, sir. He says, I'm a teacher. So I blessed him. I was Joe's partner, and what a wonderful experience that's been. I think you can tell it's difficult, but it's time for me to express my gratitude to God for all that he's done for me, to Matthew Kelly for that wonderful blessing, and to the priesthood that made that, made that possible. By the fall of 1953, Elder Cowley had been serving as an apostle for over eight years. It was during this time that he told his frequent travel companion, Bishop Glenn Rudd, that his death was not far off. On the 3rd of December, 1953, I took him to Logan, because he had to speak up there. And so on all the way up and all the way back, he tried to convince me that he was going to die soon. And because we were good friends and argued all the time back and forth, you know, I argued with him. I said, no, you, you'll be OK. No, he said, no, I know. So then on the way back, we got almost home. 
And he very seriously convinced me that he knew he was not going to live very long. So he then told me the exact hour, the time of the day, and the hour, and the circumstances, and how he would die. But he said, I don't know what day it is. One week later, on December 12th, 1953, Elder and Sister Cowley participated in the cornerstone ceremony for the Los Angeles Temple. Early the next morning, with his companion asleep at his side, Matthew Cowley took his last breath in mortality and passed to the other side. I was 15 years old when my father passed away, and I can remember at the time uh, waving goodbye from our front room window. And it was the first time that I'd been allowed to stay home in the flat on my own. So we said goodbye to my father and mother. Uh, I watched them get into a taxi and they drove off. Now, that would have been a Friday. On Sunday morning, fairly early, uh, I felt a commotion at the end of my bed and I woke up and there was my uncle uh, Maury, Morris J. Taylor. And I just looked at him and I said, is it my mother? And he said, no, but your father has passed away. It has been said that nature's noblemen are everywhere, in town and out of town, gloved and rough-handed, rich and poor. In Matthew Cowley, we find one of nature's true noblemen. Truly, he has left a legacy rich in lofty thought and virtuous deeds. Although it has been more than a half century since his death, the life and teachings of Matthew Cowley still resonate through the years. His quick wit, his simple faith, and his great love for the work of the Lord continue to inspire and lift. And again to you in New Zealand, I say, because of you, because of your kindliness, your humility, your patience, your great faith, I can stand here and say that I know that God lives, and because of you, I am a special witness of his Son. All power be to you, and God bless you forever, and bless us all, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. No te mea, he nga kau mahaki, he piripono ki te maui i nga tika nga te rongo pe i mau tonu. No rere ke a koe, i te papa, i te matua, i matua kauri i tēnā o koe, tēnā o koe, tēnā o koe. Oh.